to an all-new season of the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. This season, we're diving into some of the most unusual missing person cases from the shocking disappearance of Charlie Ross to the American Diatlov Pass dis- Sleeps podcast. Today we present another episode of the Cold Case Files. I'm your host, Larry Lace. If you want to engage with the content we provide, follow us on Twitter at True Crime NS or on Facebook. Just search True Crime Never Sleeps. Thank you for joining us as we dive deep into the unsolved murder of Robert Wone. This episode of Cold Case Files is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is an immersive murder mystery game told over the course of six episodes, or boxes. Each box is filled with different clues and physical items, such as autopsy reports, witness statements, and more. You'll use these clues to solve the ongoing murder mystery. In the final episode, you'll catch the killer. Check them out today using the link in the description and promo code TCNS for 20% off your first box. Warning, Hunt a Killer is very addicting and will keep you playing all hours of the day. And now let's get on to our episode. Robert Wone was born June 1st, 1974, in New York City. He was a fourth generation Chinese American, eventually attending the College of William and Mary as a James Monroe scholar. He then attended the University of Pennsylvania Law School. After graduating law school, Robert went on to have an esteemed career as a law clerk to Judge Raymond Jackson for the Federal District Court for the Eastern District. Virginia. He then went on to work for the law firm Covington and Burling and was finally hired as general counsel for Radio Free Asia just two months before his death. To gain some insight on what could have happened to Robert, we will explore what happened on the last day he was alive, August 2nd, 2006. At 8.45 a.m., Robert commuted to work with his wife, Kathy. This is the last time that she saw her husband. It is believed that Robert then proceeded to have a normal work day. At 9.30 p.m., Robert calls his wife to tell her that he just left the CLE class and that he's headed back to the office to meet with the night shift employees. At 9.40 p.m., Robert arrives back at the office. He gets back and meets with the night shift employees as planned. At 10.24, Robert calls Joe Price, the owner of the Swan residence, to let him know that he would be en route soon. At 10.32, Robert arrives at Swan Place a little after 10.30 p.m. According to Price Ward and Zaborski, the four men chatted for a bit, but everyone headed to bed around 11 p.m. At 11.49 p.m., Joe Price calls 911. This is believed to be the approximate time of Robert's death, although the exact time of death is unknown. At 11.49, Price places a call to 911, believing someone has come into the house and harmed Robert. After researching this case, something that struck me is the fact that Robert was spending the night in a home that belonged to a man and his partner, and there was a third intimate partner in this relationship. So in other words, Robert, as a man who identified as heterosexual and was in a heterosexual marriage with his wife, was spending the night in the home of a man who was openly homosexual and in what we would call a polonorous relationship with two other men. Now, this is not to say whether a certain behavior is right or wrong, but this is to say as far as our societal programming and as far as our social understandings are, it's typically very rare for a man who identifies as heterosexual to have close friends who identify as homosexual. It does happen, of course, but it is rare. It's also rare for a man who identifies as heterosexual to have a comfort level with a friend who identifies as homosexual. That is to the point of him feeling comfortable enough to spend the night at his home. Again, I'm not saying whether this behavior is comfort level is right or wrong. I'm just having a realistic conversation with you about society and societal programming. So of course, there are speculations of Robert's sexuality. There are some speculations that perhaps he wasn't heterosexual, and that is the reason that he had this close relationship with this man and knew uh, enough of this man to feel comfortable spending the night at his home. But there is the other coin. 
the other coin, the other side of that coin, right? And the other side of that coin would be perhaps Robert really was one of those rarities. He really was a heterosexual man. He was forward-thinking, progressive, and in a friendship with this man, and perhaps knew of this man's partners as well. And if in fact it is true that Robert was just a forward-thinking, then the fact he was assaulted speaks to something different. It speaks to the idea that perhaps there was a misunderstanding between one of these men and Robert, in which they thought the friendship meant something more. Perhaps an advance was made, and Robert rejected that advance. And that is what led to him being assaulted prior to his death. Side note, this case did happen in 2006, and we are now in 2021. There have been some major advancements made since then in our society, and friendships across different sexual identities is a lot more common. It's also important to add that Robert's friendship with Saborski, Price, and Ward was not a secret. His wife knew all three men, and had even been to the residence at Swan Street. And now we're going to take a short break. Thanks for watching this episode of the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex, for sponsoring this episode. Poddex are a tool you can use as a broadcaster or a podcaster looking to grow your audience. Shuffle up the deck, pull out a card, and let the content grow. I've used one deck, and it was a lot of fun. Check them out today. Link is in the description. And be sure to use promo code TCNS for 10% off your purchase. And now let's get back to the episode. So the investigation immediately after Robert's death was very interesting from the standpoint of how the investigation occurred, how the witnesses, which is the owner of the home, and his two partners were behaving during the investigation, and a lot of other things that happened therein. Now during the investigation, the police continued to allege more than once that something was not right about the scene in which Robert's body was found. They continued to express both orally and in several different affidavits that they believed that the scene had been tampered with. There were numerous law enforcement officers who stated that from what they observed, the scene looked to have been cleaned up. It looked to have been changed with the positioning of the body and even the surrounding area around the body. Now when the officers went in afterwards, they did a very, very thorough search. Eventually they even removed floorboards and things of that nature to try to get a better idea of where Robert's body was placed and what occurred that night, because as they had said on several instances, they felt that what they were presented with when they entered the home was not actually the original placement of the body and things of that nature. It is important to note as well that the three men were described by law enforcement to be unusually calm not just during the investigation, but immediately after Robert's death. As well, it was said that when the paramedics arrived, the three men were very calm. When the police arrived, the three men were very calm. And needless to say, it's not the usual reaction of someone observing someone who has passed away, knowing that someone has passed away in their presence, to be so calm. And so, <coughs> it is very strange that none of the people that were there tried to help the paramedics or try to assist the investigation. This case is curious indeed when initially I said that it is a curious matter, I did not use that word lightly. There are so many things that happen that just make you go, hmm, and so many coincidences that in fact perhaps probably weren't coincidences at, at all. Here's one of them. Three months after Robert's death, the residence was burglarized with one of the men, not the owner of the home, one of the owners and lover's partners brother, so Price's brother and another accomplice burglarized the home. Law enforcement have openly said that the burglary prevented them from making an arrest that they had planned to make. So if you're just thinking about this from a kind of, you know, uh, perspective, right, you might just think, oh, coincidence. But if you're thinking about it from a critical perspective, when you have law enforcement saying that a burglary of a resident in which a crime occurred prevented them from making an arrest, that crime they are inadvertently suggesting that something was taken in that burglary, something was stolen in that burglary that affected their ability to make an arrest. And what is it that people, what is that evidence? So law enforcement have already come out and said, we intended on making an arrest. We were ready to make an arrest and at that time, but the burglary set us back. Now to the theory that these could have, that there could have been an intruder who entered the home and harmed Robert. Investigators seemed very confident that the, that just was not a feasible theory. 
Now, from their perspective and their investigation, they issued an affidavit saying that it would have been nearly impossible for an intruder to scale a security fence, pass electronic devices, go up the wooden stairs, pass several other bedrooms, harm Robert, clean up the scene, and then leave without ever being detected. So now let's discuss what happened after the investigation. Law enforcement released several statements and affidavits, making it clear that they did not believe the three men were telling the truth about what happened the night of Robert's death. They also stated that they believed that Robert was restrained. Their words were incapacitated and then assaulted before his death. For those unfamiliar with the law enforcement speak, incapacitated really means that something was done to him that caused him to be out of his consciousness, out of his ability to make his own decisions. That could be a number of things. It could be that he was actually physically restrained in a way that made him incapacitated, or it could be that he was given some type of substance that made him incapacitated. Now, law enforcement then said that the three men would be charged. They were charged with conspiracy, tampering with evidence, and obstruction of justice. You know that the scene was changed around the position of the body didn't make sense. The scene around the body had been cleaned up. That's where the tampering with evidence charge comes from. And the conspiracy charge related to the three men somehow being involved in a conspiracy that involved the harming of Robert and also the disseminating of misinformation, aka the lying about what happened to Robert. Now ultimately all three men were found not guilty, but the judge who found them not guilty. It's been a long time. It is said that she spent over an hour explaining why she made her decision, and she made it very clear. She made her decision not because she believed that no evidence existed to prove that these three men were involved, but because she believed that the evidence was not demonstrated of beyond a reasonable doubt. So putting my attorney on for a moment beyond a reasonable doubt means beyond any practical explanation or other version of events. That is the best way that I've ever heard explained. So again, Beyond a reasonable doubt means beyond any other practical explanation of what could have happened or any other practical version of events. So what she is saying is it's not necessarily that these men weren't involved in what happened, but there's not enough here to not enough evidence here to rule out that something else could have happened. Possibly the intruder. To this day no one else has been arrested in the manner of the tragic death of Robert Wan and it is still relatively unknown what happened to it. Thank you for watching this episode of the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. Share your thoughts in the comment section below. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at True Crime NS, and on Facebook, just search True Crime Never Sleeps. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this case, and we'll see you next week for an all-new episode. Thank you for listening to the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. Follow us on Twitter at True Crime NS. Like us on Facebook at True Crime Never Sleeps. Send us a voice message at anchor.fm slash true crime never sleeps slash message. Tune in next week for an all new episode. <laughs>